Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another program. You are here with the Adams County Historical Society, right here being filmed in the heart of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And part of what we do is we get to preserve Adams County's best and greatest artifact collection. We have about a million artifacts in store. And in the process, we're moving to our new facility. Some of y'all have probably seen some of our photographs. We're getting a new museum complex and event center. So hopefully soon I'll be welcoming some of you in person to some of these um, events coming 2023. In the meantime, we are um, live streaming these. And I will tell you every dollar that y'all donate tonight is gonna go towards um, preservation of Adams County history. So if you do happen to see there is, I think it's a red heart button here down below, you're welcome to press that. And like I said, your donation will go towards preservation of our history. Which speaking of, we're gonna be talking tonight about one of Adams County's famous residents. And I'm so excited to um, welcome um, Lawrence Knorr, who's going to be doing a talk tonight on Eddie Plank. And Lawrence has, brings a lot of background in not only teaching, but writing and authoring many different books and um, a lot about uh, Pennsylvania Dutch culture and around the area. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over uh, to Lawrence and I'm going to have you take it away and tell us some about Eddie Plank tonight. All right. Well, that would be my pleasure. And there we go. So first of all, Abby, thank you for having me this evening. I'm really thrilled to hear that the Historical Society is moving. I, I was actually just down your way the other day recording a video. And I thought, oh, the grounds here, they need a little bit of upkeep. <laughs> I wonder what's going on. But to hear that you all are moving is, is wonderful. And I also want to thank you all uh, back when I was researching this book, I did spend some time in the facility and, and found the archives very useful, uh, a good number of items about Eddie Plank and about the Plank family. So my presentation this evening is about Gettysburg Eddie, uh, maybe the most famous citizen of Gettysburg, maybe not, uh, we could debate that, but certainly the best baseball player from the area uh, from a long time ago. I did write a book about him called Gettysburg Eddie, the story of Eddie Plank. And what we're going to see tonight and hear tonight is a lot about uh, my research in that book, uh, the things that I found out about Eddie Plank. Um, a little bit about me. I won't spend very much time on here. You all could read the slide and Abby had such a wonderful introduction. Uh, I just will add that I am a member of Saber. So those of you who are baseball uh, researchers, uh, that will mean something to you, the Society for American Baseball Research. This particular book was a Lawrence Ritter finalist back uh, when the book came out a few years ago. So that was quite an honor to even be on the list. Of course, it didn't win, but that's okay. <laughs> I didn't expect to. I was just happy to have published the book. I'm also the founder and CEO of Sunbury Press, the publishing company. So uh, hopefully you all will support that. We're based in Mechanicsburg. We have over a thousand titles uh, on, in print. We uh, sell books all over the world, wherever books are sold. And it's been a lot of fun uh, growing that business. And of course the Eddie Plank book was published by Sunbury Press. So high level, who was Eddie Plank? Uh, he was born in Gettysburg, uh, near Gettysburg, August 31st. 1875, and he passed away in Gettysburg in 1926, and so the presentation's over. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I'm going to fill in those 50-plus years here in the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, he's most known for his major league career, 1901 to 1917, most of that uh, pitching for Connie Max Philadelphia Athletics. He had a really great record that got him into the Hall of Fame. And he's known as the winningest left-handed pitcher in Philadelphia history. Most people, when they think of Philadelphia history and baseball, we only know the Phillies these days. But for many, many years, there were two teams in Philadelphia, the Athletics and the Phillies. And the Athletics were almost always better. In fact, the Athletics were one of the great teams in the American League when it was first founded. And they were the dominant team before the Yankees became big in the 1920s. So Eddie Plank was a big part of that early athletics dynasty in the early 1900s. 
can see his stats. Those of you who are baseball fans and like statistics, uh, you can see he was pretty consistent. And uh, the one thing I'll say, uh, those of you who know about earn run averages and what that means, that's how many runs he was giving up every nine innings. Uh, very low numbers. That's because he pitched in what was known as the dead ball era. So it's a period of time when uh, it's sort of like when Ty Cobb was playing, Nap Lajoie and others, it was more about hitting singles and doubles and stealing bases and uh, no home runs or very few home runs. Pitchers dominated, pitchers threw spitballs and scuff balls and whatever, because nothing was outlawed at that time. So it was known as the dead ball era, and Eddie Plank was one of the best pitchers in that era. Some interesting facts. Uh, Abby mentioned my interest in Pennsylvania Dutch history. Well, Eddie Plank was a Pennsylvania Dutchman, born into a farming family in Adams County. He was also a local hero on the town ball team, and a lot of what I researched at the Adams County Historical Society was about his local baseball games. Very hard to find information about that. Uh, on the baseball sites, like for the major leagues and so on, because that was well beyond the scope. Uh, he did sign with Connie Mack to play with the Philadelphia Athletics. He never played minor league baseball. He went right to the majors from college. He was always a pretty good hitting pitcher. He could also play defense. So uh, and when, he was a kid, when he was a kid, he played outfield and different positions besides pitcher. I think he did it, that as well in college. Played most of his career in the American League. So 1901, the first year of the American League, the Philadelphia Athletics are one of the founding teams, and Eddie is signed that year and then spends uh, most of his career there. The only exception is when he went to the Federal League in 1915 for one season, otherwise all American League. And, of course, he pitched on some of the great teams in American League history, and we'll talk about a few of those. So why did I write a book about Eddie Plank? Some people have asked me this question, so I'll answer it for you. Uh, I wrote a book about a gentleman named Carl Scheib, another Pennsylvania Dutchman, who was also a Philadelphia athletic for most of his career. And his claim to fame was he was the youngest player in baseball history when he came up. And I just thought that was an odd thing. Here, here was a guy from upstate Pennsylvania who uh, became well-known as the youngest player in the major leagues at age 16. And uh, while he didn't have a great career, it was an interesting story. I got to meet Carl. The funny thing was uh, some co-authors and I do a book called a book series called Keystone Tombstones, where we look up uh, people who have passed away who were famous or infamous in Pennsylvania. We visit their graves and we write their biographies. And I said, well, I want to do Carl Scheib because uh, Carl Scheib's an interesting guy, youngest player in baseball history when he came up to the majors during World War II. I thought, uh, you know, it's different, something to include in, in this volume. And I went and looked and Carl was still alive. So I thought, oh shoot, I can't put it in Keystone Tombstones. But I thought, what an interesting story. So on a lark, I sent him a letter and I, I found his address in Texas, and he called me one day. So I was driving down the road, and all of a sudden, I get this phone call from a former Major League Baseball player, and I nearly crashed my car as he, as he started to talk to me and introduce himself. We became fast friends. I stayed with him in Texas uh, for several days as we went over his biography. He shared with me many, many photographs and stories. We traveled up around Gratz, Pennsylvania, where he lived. We had a big book signing event up there after the book came out, and it was a real blast. So while doing the Carl Scheib book, which is called Wonder Boy, if you're interested, uh, I noticed that Chief Bender was Carl Scheib's pitching coach. And of course, Chief Bender, the Native American who came from the Carlisle Indian School, which is near where I live, I thought he might be a good guy to do a biography about next. And as I looked into Chief Bender, I saw that there were many, many books about Chief Bender. And I thought, OK, um, don't want to do that. Uh, that subject's been done. But I saw there was nobody who had there was no book about Eddie Plank. And I wondered why. And so I looked into Eddie Plank and checked him out. Um, and I thought, if not me, then who would do it? So. Uh, instead of Chief Bender, I jumped in on Eddie Plank. And uh, the other reason for it was, of course, it was he's from Gettysburg, and I'm 30 minutes from Gettysburg. So very easy for me to uh, go about the countryside and see the sites where he, 
he played and where he roamed and then also visit the historical society. So that's why Eddie Plank. I'm glad I did it. It was a great experience. I learned a lot, not only about Eddie Plank, but also about the Gettysburg area. As part of my history studies, I am working on a PhD in history. And, you know, uh, a lot of that focuses on American history. And of course, the Civil War is a big part of that. And I was very interested in what was, how was the Plank family impacted by the Battle of Gettysburg? Of course, when I opened, I mentioned that Get Gettysburg Eddie was born in 1875. Those of you who know your Civil War history know that that's 12 years after the Battle of Gettysburg. So uh, there were times when Eddie was teased when he was the oldest player in the American League. And they would say he's old enough that he was at the Battle of Gettysburg and they'd make fun of him that way. Uh, he, of course, he was not that old. He wasn't even born. He uh, was born 12 years after. But his grandfather's farm was on Willoughby Run on the west side of Gettysburg. And if you know your Gettysburg history, the Battle of Gettysburg, Heath's division came right through there. The Confederates came right through there on their way uh, to meet the Union troops uh, right where General Reynolds was killed on the first day. So a lot of the Confederate forces traversed the old Plank farm. The Plank family had fled before the battle. So these are Eddie's grandparents and Eddie's father was living here and was a young man at the time. Uh, they fled with what they could take like many farmers in the area. When they returned, the farm was devastated. Any linens, blankets, you know, anything made of cloth had been used in the field hospital. There was blood all over the place. Uh, the fence posts, anything wooden was torn down and used for firewood. And the place was just a mess, uh, no livestock left. Um, they were just devastated. So David Plank, Eddie's father, who was a young man during the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, in his early 20s, he purchased a farm north of Gettysburg in Strayband Township. And that's what's pictured here. The, the house on the right, I believe, is either a greatly refurbished house or a new house built on the site. Uh, the barn to the left is the original barn, although it's now got some siding on it. So this is where Eddie Plank grew up and also where he, he played ball. This farm is on Keller Road, which is close to the old Harrisburg Road in Strayband Township. Now, I've been down here a bunch of times uh, just to kind of connect and look around, and it's really kind of odd to uh, visit the area because there's a development there called Planks Field, and it is a, a housing development, I'd say very nice homes, each of them on maybe a quarter acre or more. And, uh, but, and, and, oh yeah, and some of the streets are named after like baseball themes like double play and line drive and things like that. But um, there's really nothing about Eddie Plank there except the name of it is Plank's Field. When you drive through the development, you're driving through the old field attached to that farm. And somewhere in that subdivision would have been the ball field where Eddie Plank played with his brothers and uh, his teammates. In fact, the Good Intent school team played at Plank's field on the Plank property, not knowing exactly where it was. Maybe it moved around year after year, depending where they cut the grass or where they hadn't planted. But um, up the road, so if you follow Keller Road, it bends past the farm and turns up towards the Good Intent School Pictured in the upper left, it is now a private residence. Back in the day, in the late 1800s, that was one of the many one-room schoolhouses around the area. And uh, there's a really neat account of that school by uh, a Mrs. Cleveland, who wrote about her, I guess, parents or grandparents who attended that school with Eddie. They had a lot of great memories. I found it astonishing when I, when I was there, as I uh, walked up that lane that here was a dirt lane that was probably very much like what it was back in the day. It's one of those few places that you, uh, despite the fact you find the subdivision on the one end, on the other end, you find this wonderful old dirt lane. And I just sort of went through this time warp 
and enjoyed that walk and imagined myself walking with the Plank Boys to school. So up that road was uh, the Good Intent School, it was known as. And at Good Intent, there was a schoolmaster, Robert Major. Uh, around the time Eddie was 20, so I don't know if he was still in school at that point, but Major starts a baseball team. And it appears that he used current and former students on that team and himself. And they played at the Plank Farm. Also on the team were Ira and Luther Plank, uh, Eddie's brothers. There might have been a third brother on the team as well at times. And they would travel around the local area and play local teams like Hunterstown and Aaronsville and so on. But that all started a good intent, and that's where he first started playing organized baseball. When he um, was then elevated to the town ball team out of Gettysburg, that team traveled to neighboring towns such as Hunterstown, I'm sorry, McSherry's town and, and others that might have been a little further out. And in 1899, there was a championship against McSherry's Town. And this is an amazing game that got a lot of publicity. The picture here, I don't want to fool you. It, that is not the game in McSherry's Town. I wish we had photographs of that game. If there were photos taken at that time, they've been lost or they're buried in someone's attic. This is just a game from the time period to give you a sense of what the games look like back in those days. But you can find that ballpark if you drive towards McSherry's town from Gettysburg and it, it's on the right hand side, uh, tucked back around a couple turns near a cemetery. And uh, that's where the old ball field is in McSherry's town. Now this is when he had one of his great games and an amazing performance for Eddie Plank that day. The headline said a mighty baseball pitcher, Plank, the Gettysburg twirler struck out 16 local players. And if you read the last paragraph, it's amazing his performance. Uh, this was in the Gettysburg Times a few days later. Of the 29 batsmen who faced Plank, only one reached third base, only two reached second base. Three hits, two of which were scratches, meaning singles, were all the home club secured. There was only one fly to the outfield. 16 of the 29 were retired on strikes. One was given his base on balls, one was hit by a pitch ball, and the remainder were retired by the infielders, with the exception of one fly to the outfield. So he was so dominant, he struck out probably 60% or more of the batters, and only one ball got out of the infield. Pretty impressive. He won 16 to nothing. And so he starts to become kind of legendary in the Gettysburg area. They're pitching for the Gettysburg Town team, and uh, this leads to him having an opportunity to pitch for Gettysburg College. Now you might note his age when he goes to college, he's 24 in 1899. That's a little older than most college students. Most freshmen, as you know, these days are 18, 19 years old. So Gettys, Gettysburg Eddie's a little bit older than you would think. The other thing to note is he actually didn't attend the college. Years later, the newspapers would talk about the college boy from Gettysburg and compare him to Christy Matheson, who went to uh, Bucknell up in Lewisburg. But unlike Matheson, who actually attended the college up there, uh, Gettysburg Eddie was not academically strong enough to qualify to go to the school. Instead, he attended the preparatory school that was on campus. This allowed him to pitch for the college team. And I suspect, and Eddie Plank III, the grandson who I've gotten to know and talk to, also suspects, although he doesn't know for sure, but the family said that uh, it's very likely that there really was no intention for Eddie Plank to go to college. He wanted to play baseball for the college team, and they found a way for him to do it. So anyway, he does. And uh, in 1899 and 1900, he's playing for um, the college team, actually might have gone into 1901 as well. The other interesting fact that was discovered of researching there at the Adams County Historical Society that helped to confirm this, uh, a lot of the newspaper accounts later on uh, when these reporters were writing about the World Series, especially against the Giants, where Matheson and Plank were facing each other, they talked about 
the two college boys going against each other, just like they had back in the old days in college. Well, Matheson moved on from Bucknell a few months before Plank got to Gettysburg College. So the two never faced each other. So that all was a myth, it was all made up by the reporters. The other thing is Chief Bender played for the Carlisle Indian School at this time. And while the Indian School did go against Gettysburg College, the two never faced each other on the mound as opposing pitchers. They did face each other playing other positions at times, or maybe Bender batted against Plank, but they never pitched against each other. So another legend that was quashed by good research. So he's pitching for the college up until about age 25, 26. You can see the team photo on the left, a bunch of guys, uh, not all of them look very young. You know, I, I often say back in the old days, young people looked older. I don't know why that is, but uh, certainly we know Eddie Plank was a little older than college age. I don't know how many of these other guys were, but that was the Gettysburg College team uh, back then. Of course, Eddie was the ace. It was a winning team. It performed very, very well. For a while, one of their coaches was a man named Frank monkey foreman monkey was his nickname and he had been a major league baseball player for a number of years he had been a pitcher he didn't have a very great record but he had bounced around and played a lot of places and he knew everybody he had a brother named brownie foreman who knew connie mack very very well and connie was down in baltimore uh, they were visiting and brownie came in to see connie and said hey my brother had told me about this pitcher up at Gettysburg College named Eddie Plank and described his exploits. Uh, Connie Mack called for Eddie Plank, probably telegraph for Eddie Plank to come on down to Baltimore to try out. He did, sign him to a contract. And then in 1901, early in the 1901 season for the Philadelphia Athletics, Eddie Plank becomes a major league baseball player, never having played in the minor leagues. So who was Connie Mack? Well, he was the winningest manager in baseball history. <clears throat> also had more losses than anybody in baseball history. He won nine American League pennants, five World Series championships. Of course, most of those were before the 1920s. He served as a manager for, oh, up until the 1950s. So it was like over 50 years that he served as a manager. His actual name was Cornelius McGillicuddy. That was simplified to just Connie Mack. And uh, if you visit his grave in Philadelphia, you have to go to the McGillicuddy grave. Uh, and there you will find him. <clears throat> he was very old school. When you see pictures of him, he, he dressed pretty much like this. You'd find him in the dugout in a suit and tie not in a baseball uniform. He was also the owner and general manager of the team, so he did everything. So as a rookie in 1901, Eddie was 25 going on 26. At the time, the team played their games at Columbia Park in Philadelphia. The team finished fourth, so it was a pretty good year. And of course, the first year of the American League. Eddie, as a rookie, won 17 games, lost 13, had a pretty good earn run average. What he was most known for is he led the league in wild pitches. So he hadn't really mastered his delivery yet. Maybe he was trying to throw a little too hard in this more competitive league. But uh, you can see that he still did very well for a rookie. 1902, the A's win the pennant. And uh, the team captain, Lave Cross, was a big part of that. Uh, another guy on the team, Sock Siebold, was the top hitter. Rube Waddell was signed by Connie Mack as a, as a pitcher and was fantastic. Of course, Eddie was also on this team. He also won 20 games, lost 15. There was no World Series in 1902 because the Pirates refused to play one. 1903 and four, the team finished... Uh, high in the standings, second and fifth, but not first. Eddie has two pretty good years, winning 23 and 26 games. He also uh, welcomes Chief Bender as a rookie, 17 wins in 1903. 
and Rube Waddell continues his dominance and uh, Harry Davis becomes the first baseman for the A's. Harry Davis later becomes the team captain. And the 1905 World Series is the first one where Plank versus uh, Matthewson occurs. This is uh, an interesting tangle, although the Giants win. The Giants were seen as a stronger team. Of course, the National League always boasted being stronger than the American League. And at this point, uh, the American League hadn't proven or disproven that yet. Uh, a little bit about the Giants at that time. Uh, McGraw was the manager, and uh, Christy Matheson won 31 games that year. 31 and 9, 1.28 ERA. A, those are from phenomenal numbers. Again, remember, this is the dead ball era. The Giants win the World Series. Uh, another note about Christy Matheson, again, another Pennsylvania boy. He was from Lewisburg, and he is buried in Lewisburg, very close to the campus of Bucknell. So that was where his home was. During the latter years of the aughts, 1900, uh, 1906 to 1909, the A's didn't win a pennant. They were fairly strong teams, but uh, just couldn't get across the finish line. Um, they did part waves with Lave Cross. Harry Davis was elevated to the team captain. Rube Waddell also fell out of favor and moved on. Uh, you could write a whole, well, books have been written about Rube Waddell and his exploits. He, he was really um, an unusual character, let's just say. Very crazy uh, behavior, but Eddie always loved him like a brother. Um, a story about Rube Waddell uh, during spring training one year, they were on, doing an exhibition game as they were coming back to Philadelphia. And Waddell wanted to show off. And he, he was really cocky and li liked to entertain the crowd. So he called in all the players from the outfield, the infield, everybody but the catcher. And he said he would get the, the opposing team out one, two, three, without the need of any fielders. And he proceeded to do that. He struck out three in a row and the crowd went nuts. So uh, not sure if the other team played along with this or not, or if he paid them off, but the legend has it that this really did happen. Uh, years later, when Waddell was dying and he died as a young man and Eddie, now a veteran pitcher, they were in spring training. They were barnstorming, uh, coming back from spring training and Eddie Plank did the same thing. He, he said, get all the players off the field. This is to honor Rube Waddell. He struck out three batters, no players in the field. Another amazing feat. So Eddie Plank tipping his cap to his buddy Rube Waddell, probably in the best way he knew how. Um, in 1909 is when the new ballpark opened in Philadelphia, Scheib Park. And that's when uh, the A's really started to time their improvements. So they now have a much bigger ballpark. They're generating more revenue. And Connie begins investing in other players. He sheds some of the players who had been with the team from the outset. He does keep Eddie Plank on the roster. He keeps Chief Bender. He also adds what's known uh, as the $100,000 infield, which today, if you wanted to spend $100,000, you might get a few innings out of one player given the salaries. But back then, that was a lot of money. And uh, the players on that list include Eddie Collins, the Hall of Famer at second base, Jack Berry at shortstop, Frank Home Run Baker at third, and Stuffy McGinnis at first base. 19, 10, and 11 now in Shy Park, the A's win back to back World Series. Uh, on those teams, Jack Combs wins 31 games in 1910. Uh, Chief Bender, 23 games. Eddie has a sore arm that year, and he still manages to win 16 games. But I don't believe Eddie makes a World Series appearance in 1910. 1911, Eddie's 23 and 8. The team makes an appearance in the World Series again. Eddie won game one against Rube Marquard, but he lost game five in release. And this is where the A's beat the Giants four games to two. Now, a little bit about the baseball card. Those of you who collect sports cards would love to have this baseball card. 
This is from the T206 tobacco card from 1910, 1911. So this came out around the time the A's were winning championships. Eddie Plank, of course, one of the best players on that team for over 10 years now. And so the American Tobacco Card Company issued this set of cards, lots of them, um, you know, lots of famous players on them. Of course, Ty Cobb, Cy Young, the Hannes Wagner card, of course, being the most valuable. And the Eddie Plank card is the second most valuable. So something happened with the Eddie Plank T206 card. Now, Hannes Wagner, he had the card pulled for him because he did not support um, tobacco use. Eddie Plank, based on my research and also what many others have said, appears that he had similar feelings about tobacco and that perhaps the card company didn't know at first that he had an aversion to tobacco. They published a card without his permission. Once he found out about it, he said, nope, don't want to be affiliated with that. So like Wagner, the card was pulled. Uh, of course, that's the most likely scenario. There are other scenarios people have talked about with broken printing plates and so on and so forth. But I can tell you, knowing Eddie uh, from my research and from talking to the family, he was not someone who cussed or smoked or drank. Uh, he was pretty straight uh, and clean. And so very likely uh, he was similar to Hannes Wagner in that regard. The value of this baseball card picture on the left of course, it's cut off a little bit, but uh, if, if you had it in its entirety and the corners were sharp, it's over $50,000. So if you find one, give me a call. 1912, the, uh, the A's finished third, but it was a very uh, competitive pennant race until late in the season, and then uh, Boston ran away with it. Danny Murphy took over as the team captain. Harry Davis was now gone. Eddie went 26 and six. He was the best pitcher on the team now, age 36 and 37. So he's starting to show his age a bit in the pictures. He's still lanky and skinny, and, uh, but he's starting to look a bit older. And of course, he's middle-aged, and he's one of the oldest players in the American League at this point. He starts thinking about retirement. Of course, most athletes, by the time they're about 35, are done. So here he is at age 36 and then 37 that season, winning 26 games. So he's still very effective at his age. 1913, he slipped a bit uh, to 18 and 10. Uh, they managed his innings a little more closely. Of course, now going on 38 years, he's in the 1913 World Series because the A's won the pennant. They again faced the Giants. And this is where... Plank versus Matheson happens again. Now, both of these pitchers are veterans and uh, two of the better pitchers in baseball history at this point. So Plank versus Matheson in game two. Christy Matheson uh, got the best of him there. But game five, uh, Plank beats Matheson three to one. And this is in the polo grounds in New York City. So the A's are away. And they win the World Series in five games, so four games to one. And incredibly, the crowd comes out on the field and carries Eddie Plank off the field because Eddie Plank pitched the entire game, including the ninth inning. So he threw the final strike and experienced winning a World Series, pitching the final strike in 1913. So he was a hero inside um, – uh, around Philadelphia, but also up in New York. Of course, a lot of Philadelphia fans traveled for that, but I can't imagine that it was only Philadelphia fans. Back then, people weren't as abusive uh, towards one another. We're a lot more friendly uh, when people came to visit from out of town. So uh, Eddie was really appreciated all around baseball. Uh, it's after this 1913 World Series, if you go into the archives and, and look around, there were a number of parties around Gettysburg big party at the hotel, uh, one of the hotels. I don't think it was the Gettysburg Hotel. I think it was another large hotel in the area at the time. A lot of dignitaries and famous baseball players came to this party to celebrate with Eddie and the team and Connie Mack and so on. Uh, parties all over the place uh, celebrating this World Series. 
uh, there was a struggle that off season, of course, Eddie, you know, he hadn't pitched quite as well. He seemed to be fading a little bit. He was thinking about retirement again. He uh, was very slow to sign a contract. He and Connie went back and forth and uh, he signs up again. Well, age 38, 39, while he doesn't have a winning record and he's nursing a sore arm most of the season, he does, they do win the pennant again. However, they lost to the Boston Braves in four games. Uh, you know, it was a pretty quick end there to the season. Obviously, the A's seemed a bit tired against the young Braves team. And Eddie lost his game one to nothing, which must have been very frustrating. Incredibly, after the World Series, Connie Mack just cuts loose Eddie Plank, Chief Bender, and Coombs, lets his three best pitchers go. Now, they were all veterans. I'm not sure how old Jack Coombs was at that time, but Chief and Eddie were, Chief was probably in his mid-30s by then. And then soon after, um, Connie sold off the $100,000 infield. So the A's are completely transformed, and Eddie's now a free agent. So going on 40 years old, what's he going to do? Well, in 1915, a new league started called the Federal League, and Eddie was now a free agent. Of course, he was pretty old for a baseball player, but the Federal League team in St. Louis offered him a lot of money to come out to St. Louis to pitch for him. The team was called the Terriers, and they had a manager named Fielder Jones. Jones had uh, predicted a near miss for the pennant in April, and that's exactly what happened. It's kind of weird how prescient he was. He's in the papers talking about how I think we're just about going to win. Well, most, most managers, wouldn't you think they'd say we're going to win? But he actually predicted a near miss. And oddly enough, the Terriers lost by percentage points. So if you know about baseball standings, they were tied in games behind. But because the Terriers had played two more games than the other team, they had one more win, one more loss. They had a slightly lower winning percentage. And thus, they were not declared the champions of the Federal League. Um, you would think if you wanted to raise some money or have a big event, you could uh, have the, the two teams play off, but they didn't do that. So Eddie spends a season in the Federal League. For many years, the Federal League was not seen as an official major league. These statistics are now counted, though, as official major league statistics. Um, he went 21 and 11. So if you look at that performance versus the prior year where he, had, he was 15 and 17, um, you know, he does rebound in his record a bit. Is that because his arm isn't sore anymore? Perhaps. Perhaps it's also because the quality of the competition wasn't quite there. Maybe it wasn't quite major league caliber, maybe slightly under, but regardless, uh, it does count now as a major league. So now going into 1916, uh, Eddie's finding the Federal League folded. Um, the St. Louis Browns, the other team, the major league team in St. Louis, which were an American League team, then had the rights to the Terriers players. They combined in those teams together. So in 1916, during his age 41 and 41, 40 and 41 season, he uh, pitched for the St. Louis Browns, who were sort of middle of the road, uh, not a very exciting team. Eddie had a mediocre record at 16 and 15 for this team. He was still very well paid. The downside was he had to travel out to St. Louis for his home games. And when the team came east to Washington or Philadelphia, then he had a chance to stop in at home. So the team, given that he was a very mature veteran, they allowed him to do that on road trips to the east. He would be allowed to go home and then join up with the team when it was his turn to pitch. Uh, this allowed him during 1916 to marry his sweetheart, Anna Cora Myers from Oxford, PA. And not soon after that, um, Eddie Plank II, his son, was born. Now, an interesting story about um, his visits home. 
I found a news clipping where Eddie was trying to get back to, I guess it was the trains in uh, Harrisburg to then continue on to a game. And he had to travel from Gettysburg to Harrisburg. Of course, he would have gone up to Harrisburg Pike, what is now Route 15, although back in those days, it wasn't the highway. It was that two-lane road, the old Gettysburg Road, or the old Harrisburg Road coming out of Gettysburg that he drove on. And uh, there was an account of him in a place called Rose Garden, where there was a railroad crossing uh, underneath the viaduct or the bridge uh, it had been washed out. There was a flood and he had to drive up and over the railroad tracks in his car and his car got stuck on the railroad tracks and the train was coming. Now imagine one of those old movies <laughs> with the music and an old car, like a model T. Well, he didn't drive a model T he had something nicer than that, but uh, your car getting stuck on these railroad tracks. Well, here he was all by himself sitting on the, the dang railroad tracks in his car with a train coming and he thought he was going to die. He uh, hopped out, pushed the car off the tracks, hopped back into the car while it was rolling down the hill. So you can imagine even at this age, he was still pretty athletic, narrowly missed the train hitting him. And so he told this story for years afterwards as one of the most exciting moments of his life. I found this spot. And so if you're on the old Gettysburg Road, and uh, there's a place where the railroad tracks come across on a bridge up over the road by the creek. And uh, Rose Garden is a development now. So it is near Dillsburg. So if you're ever curious and you want to turn off onto the old Gettysburg Road when you're in Dillsburg, uh, you can find the spot where Eddie escaped with his life. 1917, now he's married. He's, he's got the son at home. He's really thinking a lot about family. Um, in 1917, he retires in midseason when he's five and six. He's still pitching very well, but it's a bad team. And one of the things I found was right around that team, there were race riots in St. Louis. I'm not sure what triggered the race riots, so I did not uh, delve into too much the reasons for them or how terrible they were. But they were uh, reported in the papers and were uh, pretty horrendous. And here he is in St. Louis, and I think he's seeing all this strife and discord, and I think he just wanted to get home to quiet old Gettysburg as soon as possible. Um, he told the manager he was done, he quit, and uh, he went home. His last game was against Walter Johnson in 1917, so... He pitched his arm off, literally. He lost one to nothing in extra innings. And, of course, Walter Johnson, a Hall of Fame pitcher, uh, a bit younger than Eddie uh, at that time. And so his very last game might have just been the very last that he had in his arm, but uh, quite, an, quite a remarkable performance for a very last game in the major leagues after which he quit. Uh, Fielder Jones, who was managing the St. Louis Browns, now, instead of the Terriers, wanted to get him back in 1918. Eddie said he wasn't going to pitch. The Browns traded him to the Yankees and got players for him. But in 1918, Eddie did not report to the Yankees. He did not want to pitch for the Yankees. In fact, he did not want to play. So the Yankees gave up players for the rights to Eddie Plank and got nothing in return. Uh, sometime late spring, early summer, he signed with the Steelton team in the Industrial League. So uh, Steelton had a baseball team that would play against other teams in that industrial league. And they had some former professional players, chief vendor among them. Uh, this was more for entertaining the workers. I think it also had something to do with avoiding the draft in world war one, although Eddie was married and older. Um, I think he just wanted to play a little bit and accepted the invitation to make some money to pitch. He did pitch very well at age 42 in the Industrial League, and, and there are some interesting news accounts in the archives for the Harrisburg newspapers. So after that 1918 season, he did not play professional baseball again. He spent a lot of time with his family. He liked to hunt and fish. He and his brother opened an automobile dealership and garage downtown. Um, he also umpired local baseball games. Uh, tragically, though, uh, uh, when he was 50 years old, going on 51 in 1926, so he's still a fairly young man, and he's only been retired for eight years. 
when he had a stroke uh, one day, I think it was a Sunday, he was with the family at Sunday dinner or Sunday lunch, and he felt a pain in his head, a headache, and he wanted to go lay down. They came home and he laid down and uh, suffered this stroke that paralyzed his left side. So the great left-handed baseball pitcher lost the use of his left arm and left leg with this stroke. And uh, he did not linger very long. He only lived another day or so uh, with the stroke. Connie Mack, when he heard the news, wept and said, I have lost a son. They were that close. For all those years, uh, he always looked highly at Eddie Plank. Eddie Plank, the well-behaved one, unlike Rube Waddell, who was crazy, and some of these other guys who uh, were a little rough. Eddie Plank uh, had a better demeanor more of a, of a country gentleman, Eddie Plank always appreciated him very much. So Eddie Plank is remembered in many ways. If you're familiar with Gettysburg, of course, there's the sports bar and restaurant, Gettysburg Eddie's. Um, if you want a copy of the book, you can always go in there, get a pint, and they sell the books behind the counter. Uh, Eddie Plank also remembered around town in Gettysburg with some uh, roadside signs, historic markers, his, his last home is, is there near the college. If you uh, follow some of the, the things in this presentation in the book, you can of course find the Plank Farm and Plank Field north of town and the, the Good Intent School, of course, as well. But there are no markers for Eddie uh, up at the school, just, just the Plank uh, Field. He's also, of course, memorialized in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, he has a plaque there and he was inducted in 1946. And I think there's still a gymnasium at the college named after him. There was for many years, the Plank Gymnasium at the college. So that's uh, my presentation on Eddie Plank. I'll just plug a few more books that we're working on that where I'm a co-author. So the Joes, Joe Farrell, Joe Farley, and I have been working on Graves of Our Founders, where we're traveling around the country, going to the graves of all 200 plus founders of the United States and writing about them. So the first two books are out, there's gonna be four. And as part of that, we're also uh, including, or spinning off state books or regional books. So we created one for Pennsylvania where we put just the Pennsylvania Patriots into that one and Chesapeake Patriots. So we'll probably do that too, where we have a, uh, a view of the books more regionally. Uh, we also do a series called Keystone Tombstones, and that includes politicians, famous movie stars, uh, of course, founders, musicians, authors, criminals, you know, anybody who's famous or infamous that has an interesting story uh, we visit uh, their graves and also write their biographies. And it, it adds a, an interesting dimension to it to actually visit the cemeteries where they're buried and see their situation and then know that uh, you're, you're honoring them that way. And of course, there are some uh, spinoff books of the Keystone Tombstones. There is a book on the Civil War where we we talk about some of the major people from the Civil War that are buried in Pennsylvania. And then we carve out from that a Gettysburg book where some of the important people from Gettysburg are also covered um, in, a, in a little bit thinner volume. So what I'll say is you don't have to buy Civil War and Gettysburg. You can get all the information in the Civil War book. But if you only want to know about Gettysburg, you can just, uh, just buy that one. All right. If you have any questions, I'm always open to talk. Best to get me through email, lnor at sunburypress.com. If you ever need a speaker for an event or a meeting, I'm always interested in helping out. And uh, not saying I'll always be available, but always looking for those opportunities. And I've gone around uh, the region and, and given many talks over the years. If you're interested in our books, we have over a thousand titles, 500 authors, um, our books at sunburypress.com and wherever books are sold. So thank you for listening.
So that was great. We uh, really appreciate your insight on that, Lawrence. That was very, very interesting about, um, I liked how you tied the baseball statistics to history. Uh, I know a little about baseball. My brother's a big baseball fan, but I don't know enough I'm learning. So it's kind of funny that I was like, Ooh, I'm learning that. And at the same time I'm learning history. So yeah. that was very cool the way you had that laid out for us. Um, thank you very much to those that um, watched this evening. Thank you to those that donated. Um, every dollar of course is going to help us. And if you do have questions, I'm going to make sure they get over to Lawrence to make sure that he can get them answered for you. So feel free to leave them in the chat and I'll um, get you in contact with them so that he can get those answered for you. Um, again, Lawrence, thank you so very much. Any last thoughts for us? Yeah, just uh, come to Gettysburg. It's a great place to visit. There's a lot here. And just know there's, a, there's more to Gettysburg than a battle. Go to Gettysburg Eddie's. Check out uh, the, Gettys the Gettysburg Eddie story, Eddie Plank. He's a fascinating person, um, real clean cut guy, and a fantastic uh, baseball player. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody so much for watching. Lawrence, thank you so much. We will see you all next week for another Thursday night um, program, and we'll have another cool topic for you. Right. So, thank you so very much. Thank you.